You ever argue about what doesn't matter? Right. When's the last time you had an argument that you'd be ashamed to tell me about? <laughs> yeah. Who's going to do the dishes? Whether we go to eat at this restaurant or that one. The stereotypical church argument is what color the carpet will be. I can't tell you how many jokes I've heard. Right? It seems to me that when we argue about things that we're embarrassed to admit about later, there is actually something that matters there, right? If you're arguing about who takes the trash out, what are you arguing about really? It's not the trash. It's what everyone's carrying their, their, full, their share, right? Now, if you argue about when, where you're going out to eat, is it really about the food? No, it's about whether you're listening to me. Right? Are you listening? Right? It's not about whether we go to Ruby Tuesdays or not. Uh, if we, uh, you argue about the carpet in the church, are you really arguing about the color? No, you're arguing about whose church it is. Right? That, that's what you're arguing about. Whenever we argue about something, we only argue about what matters. Right? There's always something going on under, underneath, even if we don't quite see it right there at the surface. And, e and even if an argument is so completely dumb that it truly doesn't matter, what that tells me is a person's sense of what matters is off. And then that matters, doesn't it? Right? And so we only argue about what matters. Right? We debate and argue about what, what we care about. Right? And, and we have a tendency to debate. Right? We want to. We want to be right. right? And, and John Wesley had to deal with this tendency about people's tendency to argue. And he had to deal with it often because, you see, he had this uh, movement. Right? He starts gathering people who are serious about following Jesus. And he gets them together during the week. And they, gets them, and, and they get together during the week, and, and at first they're gathered around what they've all agreed about. We need to be more serious about following Jesus. But you start doing that for a few months and a few years, and after you've done that for a decade of getting together, you've had time to be very clear what you agree about. But how, it takes a while to figure out what you disagree about, but eventually you come across it, right? What, you, you think that? And then what do you do? You, you argue, you debate, you disagree. And this was kind of um, made more challenging what Wesley was doing when this, this Methodist revival thing that happens at the 18th century is how this church started. John Wesley starts getting people together, getting together once a week to, to be accountable to each other, to read scripture together, to pray with each other. To have everyone offered a penny so that, they, that those groups could go out and do something to help others. And so these groups are gathering, but... They're not Methodist in the way that we say Methodist today. Right? When I say I'm a Methodist, what's that mean? Right? It means I go to church on Sunday morning at a Methodist church with a Methodist pastor, and there's a Methodist way of thinking through things. That didn't exist for those first decades, because there's no such thing as a Methodist church. There were Anglicans who went to the Methodist meetings, and then there were Baptists who went to the Methodist meetings, and there were Presbyterians who went to the Methodist meetings, and there were Catholics who went to the Methodist meetings. They all went back to those other churches on the weekends. And then they were got together during the week at this Methodist thing. It's, it's kind of analogous to in the, the first century, or the first decades of the, of the church. If you think about it, we, they were Christians, but no one was raised a Christian. You were a Jew who had decided to follow Jesus. Or you were a Gentile who decided to follow Jesus. So they were Christians, but they weren't Christian in the same way that we think of Christian today. We say Christian today, and you think usually of people who have been Christian all of their lives. Well, what, if you were 15 when Jesus was crucified, you can't have been Christian all your life because there was no such thing as a Christian at that point. You had to choose to become a Christian, and so you had a past. Right? In the same way, when uh, Wesley is gathering these people together and they're meeting weekly, they all had a past. They all have a background. They're getting together with what they agree about during the week, and then they're going on Sunday mornings, they're going out to their Baptist and Presbyterian, Catholic and Anglican churches, and they're all practicing following Jesus in very different ways. And then they get together during the week, and Wesley's got to hold this together, because they have agreed what is most important, they're going to follow Jesus together, but then they have all these differences predestination or free will? Is the authority of the church vested in bishops or is it in the presbytery? Is the king the head of the church or is the king, or is it the pope who's the head of the church or should no one be the head of the church? These are all these arguments that you, people were getting into. And so Wesley had to <clears throat> sort of rope it all in and keep people focused on agreeing on what they agreed upon, 
let's follow Jesus. And could we just chill on the rest? Could we just, right, take a deep breath right, and chill? Right? And so <clears throat> John Wesley turns to Scripture to find guidance on how to, to work with a very contentious people who tend to argue a lot. And the Bible's a very good place to go to find people who are contentious and argue about, because it's the story of Israel. And the name Israel means struggles with God. Isra is the Hebrew for struggle, and El is the short form of Elohim, God. And so the, to be God's people is to be arguing, right? The, by the very nature, to be, to be Israel, to be part of Israel is to be struggling with each other and to be struggling with God. We live into our name nicely often, don't we? And so Wesley turns to this moment in the Old Testament in the story of Israel where there is a <clears throat> two kings who come together and meet, Jehu and Jehonadab, who takes the cake is one of the hardest names to pronounce in Scripture. And uh, Jehu is the king of the ten northern tribes, Israel. There are twelve tribes of Israel. They're split north and south, ten and two. And Jehu has the ten northern tribes, and Jehonadab has the southern two tribes. And Jehu is following a scuzzball. I, don't find, I can't think of a, a better way to put that. Ahab and Jezebel are, are who he's following. And, and Jezebel, he, it, she's the original Jezebel. Right? And so he's following them, and, and, and he is in the middle of a political purge. He, he, at that point in the story, that little snippet I read you, he has killed 70 sons of, of uh, Ahab. I mean, still, 70 sons, that's impressive. But also, he's killed all of them, and that's depressing. And so, and he's, he's going to go finish his purge. And so, in the middle of this horrible moment, and then Jehu, the king of the southern, southern two tribes that has the temple, um, a little bit more uh, faithful, a little bit more low-key, uh, they come together, and these two kings look at each other, and they say, you know what, can you be of one heart with me? Right. You may or may not agree with how I'm going about this. He didn't. But can we be of one heart? Can we agree about what's essential? And he said, okay, we can be of one heart. And so Wesley looks at that and says, you know, if those two kings can figure out how to get along when they disagree about so much, you know, maybe that's worth looking at. And then Wesley flips a few pages forward and finds Jesus' command to the disciples. He has them at the Last Supper. He's just washed their feet. And he says, as I have loved you, you, you now go love each other. A new commandment I give you. As I love you, you now go love each other. And, and this is the command that Wesley understands to be given to the, the people who have chosen to follow Jesus and have been doing it for a while, the mature Christians. And, and Wesley holds these two together as being what he needs to, to help people understand if the, this whole Methodist thing is going to hold together about what's important instead of flying apart at the hinges about everything else. Right, being of one heart and figuring out how to love each other. Now, it's important to note that we can be of one heart because we're never going to be of one mind. Uh, we're all going to disagree, period, right? That we are always going to have as many opinions as there are people in the room. Paul understands this in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. He says, we, we know in part. Well, we don't know everything. We only know in part. So I know something, and you know something, and, and you know something else, and everyone knows a little bit of something, and we have our opinions, and we're wrong. You are wrong about something you believe. And so am I. We just don't know what it is. Right? We, we are all profoundly wrong about something. We're just not sure what it is yet. And so we're, all, we're not all ever going to be of one mind, because we're all always going to be disagreeing. So the best we can say is, let's be of one heart. Well, be of one heart, be of one connected around what is most essential. And, and for Wesley, he says to be of one heart, all right, first, uh, it's n is not to insist that everyone do as I do. Right? You don't have to be just like me to be of one heart. You, don't have to, you can pray differently, sing differently, uh, worship differently, preach differently, and that, that's okay. We're going to do things differently, and that's, that's fine. To be of one heart is to believe together in the one God who created us all, who is perfect in power and wisdom and justice. To be of one heart is to agree that we follow Jesus who is crucified for sin. To be of one heart is to agree that we love the Lord our God with our heart, mind, strength, that we give thanks in all things. To be of one heart is to be employed together in doing God's will, lining up our desires with God. Right? To be of one heart means we need to love our neighbor even when our neighbor is our enemy. And to be of one heart is to take all of this and show our love of God by what we do. Now, this is admittedly an impressively challenging list. If you're doing these things, that's quite a bit. 
But there's a lot more we could disagree about. But this is the essentials, right? If we're of one heart, we can disagree about all the others, but that's what holds us together. Right? To agree upon all of these, we can say that we are of one heart, so we can walk hand in hand on this. And then let live and let live on the rest, right? If, you're, if we agree upon these things, we, we can disagree, and, and people can go their separate ways and, and believe their separate things and be part of the separate churches, the separate groups, the separate families, part, different political leanings, whatever it is, as long as we agree upon these essentials. Right? There's no need to dispute the non-essentials as long as we hold to what being of one heart, those essentials that, that Wesley lists. So as we go and follow Jesus in whatever way we are convinced is best, we, we then seek to love each other. Right? It's, it's to, to be of one heart then changes how we to treat each other. If we're of one heart, we're going to treat each other in a way that is distinctive, that follows Jesus' commandment to love each other. Right? To love each other as brothers and sisters of Christ. Now who do you bicker with most? your brothers and sisters, but to hold on to the brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are part of a family headed towards the same place in the end. Wesley tells us that this love for each other should be long-suffering and kind, patient when another is ignorant or out of sorts, instead of thinking evil being gracious, and ain't that the kicker, right? Someone does something, and, and you, you, you see them, and you, you want to think, why did they do? <sighs> Gracious. They had their reasons, right? Gracious. Right? To speak honorably of each other. To pray for each other. To pray for each other often, for each other's patience and hope and faith. To provoke each other to do, to do good works. Reproving each other as necessary. Amending the faults that we see. Strengthening what is weak. Building each other up in a way that is honest and gracious. Wesley doesn't ever use the word nice. Wesley, I don't think, really cares about nice. Honest and gracious is what he would recommend. Being honest and gracious with each other. Love, loving each other not just in what we say, but also in what we do. Not seeking to change another's opinion. It's not going to happen, right? Not often. But being as gracious and flexible as possible so that whatever we can do together, that's what we do together. And this combination seems to just make sense to me, to, to first say, let's be of one heart. Let us name what is the essentials. And if we can agree upon what is essential, that we follow God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we believe Jesus died for our sins, we accept that, we, we have accepted that we are forgiven, we are following Jesus in what we do and in what we say. If we can agree upon that, then we should be able to love each other, right? We should be able to be gracious to each other. We should be able to be patient with each other. We should be able to be, just go out of our way to do good for each other and, and not to think ill, but to, to think the best of each other. And this is the way that, that Wesley forms the, uh, those who are part of the Methodist revival so that they don't blow apart at the seams. Right? He, he forms them and he calls this, this spirit the Catholic spirit. Catholic this is one of the few words where capitalization matters just so much. Catholic with a little c means universal. Right? To be of a Catholic spirit is to see the universal way that we are all bound together as followers of Jesus. Catholic with a big c says you love the Pope. But that's not what we're talking about here. Catholic with a little c. It's the little c that's in our, the Apostles' Creed, too. We are, the Catholic faith is to see all other Christians as following the same Lord. Now, Wesley admits that this can be misunderstood, right? To talk about this sort of acceptance of others, he says you can think that this might be called a uh, speculative latitudinarianism. Yep, there's your $5 word for the day. I had to look at that about twice before I figured out what it meant. Speculative latitudinarianism. Wishy-washy. That's what he's saying. Wishy-washy. Being so graceful that you become spineless. Oh, that's just fine, when it really isn't. That's not what Wesley is talking about here. If you look at that list of essentials he lays out, to be of one art, you can't be spineless. It, to be wrapped up in God's dreams and committed to God's goals, to be serving God actively day by day, you're not going to be spineless. You're just saying that I follow this way and you follow that way. This is not an anything go, easy living, just whatever, right? People who are, this is advice for people who are mature Christians who are so busy following Jesus that they just don't have time to argue, to get into pedantic arguments about things that really just don't matter, 
Right? This is a demanding discipleship focused on exactly that, being a disciple, committed to Christ, being graceful with others who are also committed to Christ, even if they're not committed in the same way. The practical purpose of all of this, as always, for Wesley, is to make sure that they could agree upon what's important, and they could stop arguing about faith, and instead focus on practicing faith. Right? The Methodist Church is an amazing thing, because every other tradition in the entirety of history, I've gone through and checked on this, every other tradition, every other church, every, every other denomination begins because people disagreed about faith. They argued about faith. They got down in the weeds and they argued some aspect of theology or biblical interpretation. Methodism begins because, stop arguing about faith. How do you live it? All right? That's what Wesley wanted to keep people focused on. How do you live this faith? Agree on the essentials, let everything else be secondary, and let us focus on living this faith. How do we do it? All right? and, and I think this is something we need more than ever today. The ability to say, this is what is essential, this is what holds us together, and everything else is just secondary. Because when we start disagreeing, what happens nowadays when we start disagreeing? If I disagree with you, how does it come off? Right? People take it personally. If I say that your position is wrong, what people tend to hear is you are wrong. Right? People get, you disagree, and then things start blowing apart at the seams. If we disagree about things, so what? I'm not surprised. We're going to disagree about things all the time. As long as we agree about what's essential, the rest, eh, whatever. It's not essential. Right? If I disagree with you, or you disagree with me, that's life. Right? That's how it's always going to be. We are called to be a people who can agree about what's most important, Jesus, and then focus on following him, and let all that secondary stuff be exactly that. Good discussion over a cup of coffee, but eh, whatever. It's a skill that I believe that we are called to cultivate as a way of loving each other, as a way of being gracious with each other. Right? This is our commandment that Jesus lives, leaves for us, and I think it's always important to remember he leaves it for us not in the... In a, Jesus doesn't say this new commandment I give you in some sort of abstract moment, like Sermon on the Mount, just sort of pontificating. Right? Jesus says, I leave this command for you after washing each other's feet. Right? This is not, oh, just love each other in a way that's sort of abstract. Wash each other. Serve each other. Be there with each other. Get practical. Stop arguing. Practical. But Wesley really just focuses in on that. And, and part of the reason I love what he, what he says about how this is how you read Scripture. The way that we gather together as Christians, I think, is essential. For we gather together as Christians who are saved and being saved daily. And to gather around that also means that we're going to take everything else that's secondary and just let it be secondary. We follow Jesus together. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Amen.